I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be empowered. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. For me, Victoria Kubo is one really strong lady. She's always in charge and you can really catch her over emotional. And she was the exact same way for this interview. In charge. Except when she had to talk about a very special person that she lost in her life. Please watch. I grew up in Ibadan. Uh, a small city of Ibadan, right? Well, big city of Ibadan. It's not really, it's a big city. I lived with my parents. My mom had two of us, yeah? My, me and my brother, who eventually, who left for the States at some point. I remained in Ibadan with my mom. Uh, I have one half sister and four half brothers. One of my brothers died, my half brothers died. And at some point it was just me and my mom at home. Growing up with my mom was, well, hilarious now that I think about it. It wasn't so hilarious then. It wasn't so funny then. But without a doubt, I, I know for sure that she really, really loved me. At that time, I thought she loved my, my brother and hated me. Because then we just got away with murder, you know? But maybe it's that thing of, okay, she's a girl. But she was really tough on me. I got a lot of beating. You know, for half of the stuff, I didn't even know why I was being beaten. <laughs> I mean, for some reason, he got to drive first. He could take the car out anytime he wanted to. My mom enrolled him in driving school. And I was just there. So I had to learn, I had to teach myself how to drive. Sometimes I'll beg my brother to please teach me how to drive. I, I remember the first time I drove to Lagos from Ibadan. It was, it was, this is another story. So I'd been learning how to drive. Um, I asked my friend to teach me, my brother sometimes, and it was not like I had a proper teacher, but somehow I started moving the car. So one day, my brother and his friends wanted to come to Lagos. And I begged them to let me drive to, to get to the toll gate. Okay, I'm like, don't worry, let me just drive. When I get to the toll gate, I'll give you the car and everything. And I got to the toll gate and I did not stop. And, I drove, and they were like, for me, stop, you can't. And I said, nope. And I drove to Lagos you know, for the first time. And that was when I kind of knew I could do anything. My father was also very strict and he believed in talking to, I don't think my dad ever beat me. But funny thing, now that I think about it, he beat my, my, my brother more than he beat me. So I don't know what it, I don't know what it's, maybe it's the boy girl thing, I don't know. My mom did a lot of beating and my dad would yell at her and tell her to stop. Especially since sometimes I would run across the street when she was trying to catch me, she would throw things at me. If this were the stage, they will probably arrest her right now if she were alive. <laughs> you know what? Coming for questioning. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it is. But, but I know she loved me. Now that I'm a mo mother, I, I understand why she did the things she did. I really do. Because you have a child, you want the best for your child, and you feel, let me give her the right foundation now that I can, you know, before she goes out there. Nobody's going to love your daughter like you do. So I'm um, understanding that now. It took me this long, and that's my regret. I wish I knew. Yeah, because then it was... I thought she hated me, and I would ask her if she was my real mom. I thought I was adopted. <laughs> I thought I was adopted, but, you know, now I know better. The way I'm bringing up my daughter, has, I had, I've, I've, I've learned a few things from my mom. But what I have done is, the relationship I had with my mom then, I wasn't so close with my mom because, again, I thought she hated me. I didn't understand that she loved me. So our relationship was not that great. We fought most of the time. I'd lock myself in my room most of the time. But what I'm trying to correct with my daughter is give her that love, give her that discipline, 
but there's more of a conversation going on between both of us. We're talking more. So for everything I do, I'm explaining to her the reason why. And sometimes she knows already. You know, sometimes like, okay, mom, I know I'm grounded. You know, she knows. She knows what's coming, you know. So that is what I'm trying to fix. So we're much, I'm, my relationship with my daughter is better than one I had with my mom. But the, the foundation is the same. The discipline is the same. But not quite though, now that I think about it. Yeah. My husband has never smacked my daughter. You know, he believes in, let's sit down, let's talk about it. Yeah. And I believe in that because the kids now, I mean, kids are smarter now. Um, the, the, what, is, what is important for me is to teach her about consequences. You know, when you do this, this is the consequence, you know, and you have to be, you have to be ready to do the time. <laughs> you have to be ready. So it's the balance we're looking for, you know. I smack her once in a while, but I smack her for effect. There has to be an objective. Don't just smacking the child for no reason. Because you also want to, you don't want to toughen the child up and if you don't tell her anything, then she just becomes really tough and say, like, okay, so beat me and that's it. It's important to, conversation is important. This is what I'm trying to say. High school was nothing spectacular for me, you know. I was, I was never one of the cool kids. I was not a cool kid. Um, my mom made a, she intentionally made sure I didn't go to school with my friends because when we left primary school, all my friends wanted to go to a particular school, St. Anne's, and I wanted to go to that school. But for some reason, she took me to another school and I was the only one from my former school at the school. I had to listen to my friends talk about how they, they, you know, they made new friends and they didn't even have to make new friends sometimes if they didn't want to because there was a lot of them. I didn't understand then why, but maybe that was my mom trying to teach me to be my own person, to be, you know, don't move with the crowd. Honestly, right now I, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's, I guess that's probably why she did it and it has paid off. I went to school on this particular day, would usually close at two o'clock and I'll get back at three o'clock typically from school. My aunt came to pick me up and then took, we went to pick up my cousin from another school. And she took us out, we went to, do, went to shop, she took us to a restaurant, we ate and I was a bit worried about, you know, not going home directly from school. But I thought I'm with my auntie, so I mean, she'll talk to my mom. And she assured me she was going to talk to my mom. So I had a good time, had fun. So at about eight o'clock, she took me home and my mom saw her and, you know, we exchanged pleasantries. Hi, how have you been? Long time. How now? She sat down for a few minutes, chatted, had a drink. And she said, oh, I'm the one who took um, my daughter to, you know, wherever we went to. Um, so and my mom said, it's okay, ah, she's with you now, and it's okay, not a problem at all. Thank you for bringing her back, and she smiled and everything. And as soon as my auntie left and drove off, my mom gave me the beating on my life. I was yelling, and she said, next time you insist they bring you home <laughs> before you go anywhere else. So that's one of the, yeah, it's my typical mom. I had a hard time getting to university because of jam, you know. I was, um, I was an average student. Well, in my primary school, I was not average. I was, you know, I always come first, second or third. But when I came, secondary school was okay. You know, I wasn't an, an all A student or anything like that, nope. Um, but maybe now I understand because I, I, I would always break rules. I never really liked rules. I also find that, I mean, no offense to the guys with the first class and straight A's. But when you think about it, the guys with the A's are the people who will take what the lecturer gave to them and give it back to them, you know. So there was a day in class, a teacher came, one of our lecturers came and he explained a concept to us and he told a story and I got it. And we had a test the next day, right? And he asked a question. And I told that same story the way I understood it. And 
I got very high marks and everybody else, they, they were going very technical, you know. Right now, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that is the way, I guess maybe if I had somebody teach me like that, maybe I would have been an A student. I don't know, but I was just more of a, I liked stories. I liked, I just, I didn't like the technical, technical bits where you'd have to just give people back and cram stuff. I just never liked that. So, yes, I, I was not an A student like that, you know. I didn't go for all my classes in the university. Yeah. <laughs> I just went through school, you know? I remember my first love, or what I thought was love at the time, because with maturity and age, you begin to question some of those things. But it was such a wonderful feeling. At the time, it was about this one person, and nothing else mattered. Nothing else mattered, you know? go into my room, sit there all day. If I'm not with him, I'm thinking all day about this person. Where is he now? Then I used to write letters, you know. Um, I don't know what my mom did to me, but he wanted, he wanted us to have sex. And I said, no. And he said, well, if you love me, you know, we'll have sex. And I said, no, I'm not going to, you know, I love you, but I'm not going to have sex. And there and then, I just felt, if you're making this a condition, then you didn't really love me. Now, I don't even know how I came to that realization. I don't, it was a very mature thing for me to, but I don't know. Maybe it's my, maybe I was scared of my, I don't know what it was. And that was how it ended, you know. And um, of course, I missed him. I think we, we tried to get back again. I think that happened. But then, you know, we went, both went our separate ways. But... Um, it was really sad. It wasn't like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm done. And you know, it was really sad. Days and days of crying, locking myself up in the room. But very quickly, I also figured that out that the way to get over anything was to just get the emotions out there. So when I felt upset about anything, I'll lock myself in and have a good cry. I have a good cry. And then when I'm done, that's it. It helped. It was therapeutic for me. Yeah, so. Victor and I are almost related. We're not related, but we're almost related. I, I tell him if we're not married, it's one of those relationships where you will call each other cousins, like, you know. Um, so my mom is Igbo, and she's from Ojoto, Victor's village. So we... Every time we went to my mom's village, we'll see the Okigos, yeah, because we came from the same village. And my, my mom's brother married his aunt. So we had to go ask, like, are we related? Is it okay for us to do this? <laughs> you know? Um, so it was one of those um, events uh, in the village where I met Victor for the first time. And I went with my cousin, who's also Victor's cousin, so we share cousins. We have, you know, of course. Went my cousin to their house and I went to this room, music was blasting, with so many guys drinking, he was smoking. And I was really young then and I stayed as far away from him as possible because that is the typical man or boy my mom told me never to talk to. So my mom was somewhere in the village. I was like, if my mom catches me in this house, I'll be dead. I later found out he was checking me out for whatever, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with this guy, this crazy guy drinking and smoking. And um, he said hi, we spoke, and then we went back to Enugu, and I think I spoke to him on the phone once, and that was it. I didn't see him again after that. And um, years later, came back to the village for some funeral, and he saw me, I was like, aha, there you are. I'm like, there you are, what? Yeah, I've been looking for you, really? So we start talking, and it's one of those things, we ended up spending the whole day together, like really talking. But of course, before then, I, I, I knew he had this girlfriend he was seeing, and they were pretty serious, and everybody expect, expected them to get married. And so I asked about this person, I was like, how is this person? He said, oh, well, actually, she just broke up with me, and... Um, I actually planned to go from here back to Lagos, to Enugu to go talk to her because, you know, 
I want her back and all that. But you know, now that I've seen you, I'm like, uh, 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 don't tell me that, you know, go sort out your issues. Um, just leave me alone. You know, I, was, I, I just came out of a relationship then, so I, I really didn't care much about a, another relationship. So he um, went off to Enugu and I went back to Ibadan. And he said he wanted to see me again. He spoke on the phone, said he wanted to see me again. And I'm like, okay, if you want to see me, then you come to Ibadan. And he said, really? I said, yeah. And I didn't know he was going to come. He has never been to Ibadan. And he came to Ibadan. He got lost, he went through hell, you know. Came to Ibadan and I asked, so what happened to your girlfriend? He said, well, actually, he, got, he went to see her like he said he would. And they started talking and she was like, yeah, this is the reason why I've broken up with you. You're never there. Gave, her, gave, him, all the, gave him all the reasons why they were going to break up. And he said, you know what? I agree with you. I think we should break up. <laughs> Because now he knew he'd found somebody else. So that's what he said. And like they say, the rest is history. Well, he said he knew that I was the one. But I, I, um, I didn't know he was the one. I'm not even going to lie about that. It was a relationship. And, but with him, I, I thought I tried harder to make it work. It was almost like with the others, I didn't really give a toss if it wasn't going to work. But with Victor, I really, really tried to make it work. Like, even when we had fights and I, you know, I would calm down and listen. And so I put in a little bit more work. And um, yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the sign. I don't know. Victor and I can fight like 10 times in a day and make up. That's it. It's not nothing personal. I can tell Victor how I really feel. Like how I really, I can tell him he's full of crap, you know, and he'll take it, you know, and he, he can tell me the same, you know. And if I told him, I'm always coming up with ideas. I come up with ideas every two seconds and I'll share my ideas with him and he'll tell me, no, he's always playing devil's advocate. And most times, of course, I don't like it. But when I'm alone in my bedroom or somewhere I can think, he actually makes a lot of sense. So he helps keep me focused also. We balance each other up very well. Um, he's, so yeah, I, I'm the tough one, right? Um, Victor is very sweet and nice and more forgiving and he'll allow things slide sometimes. I will just not let things go, you know? But I think he's come to accept me the way I am. And we, I, I really love the chemistry because there's some qualities in him that I, I, I wish I had, and I think same with him. So we talk a lot about our businesses, about things happening. We plan ahead together. So um, he bring, we definitely bring different things to the table. I just had a baby, so she came to Lagos. She's based in Ibadan, she came to Lagos to see the baby the first time. She saw the baby, got really excited, and then went back to say, look, I'm gonna come back to come take care of the baby properly. And then she came back. And um, the next day she said she was gonna see her friend. She has this friend, a much younger friend, but this friend had been married for like 10 years or 18 years or something, and just had twins. So she said she was gonna go see that friend. Now, the night before, we had a big fight and I was not speaking to her. She was in my house and I wasn't speaking to her. And I was not going to talk to her. I was really mad. But before she went to see this friend, she came into my bedroom and said, hi. And, you know, we talked a bit. I talked to her very reluctantly, but we chatted. And I can still remember, there was this, there's this mirror in my house at the time. She looked in the mirror, checked herself out and, you know, tied her gilly and went off. That was the last time I saw my mom. She, there was nothing wrong with her. The next thing, that same day, my, I got a call from this friend saying my mom had slumped. It's like, meanwhile, I had a baby, new baby, two weeks. My husband, my husband had gone to work and I couldn't leave the house. So I had to wait for him to come back from work. And I told him what had happened. And we went straight to the hospital. And I didn't like the hospital they took her to, I was really mad. And then we moved her to another hospital and 
<laughs> the rest is history. That's how she left. And that's when I know that the whole Nollywood movie and, you know, when someone dies and someone is yelling and screaming and rolling on the floor, it's all lies. Because that didn't happen to me. Um, so when they told me, I was like, okay. And I was really numb. Like, okay, that's fine. It's really cool. And um, I think it was the next day I actually cried. But it gets tougher after the funeral, during the funeral. And then one more thing, I refused to see her corpse. I just couldn't, you know. And the reason was because I didn't want to remember my mom lying in a box. I didn't, I, so right now, I remember her checking herself out in the mirror. If my mom were alive now, I think we'll be really close, really, really close than we've ever been. She died two weeks after I had my baby. That is the worst thing ever. Like, who loses their mom two, two weeks after they, they've had a baby? And I was, I was mad, I was mad at her. I was, I, I believe that there was, like, there was like one year of my life that I don't even know what happened. It was like a blur, because her first granddaughter, her first grandchild, and she left. I, I think I cried every, every day for one year. I, I mean, it, it was, I still cry now, not as much, but it was really painful for me. I was, at first I was mad. Second of all, it was a bit, a bit of pride. It was almost as if it was okay for other people to lose their moms. How dare I lose my mom? Like, it's okay for other people to die, but not my mom. And then after that, I did something. I called my friends who had lost their moms years before, and I apologized to them. And the reason I did so was because, you know when somebody dies, you're like, oh, sorry, oh, don't cry. It's, everything's gonna be okay. It's a lie. Especially when you don't know, you haven't been through it. That's one thing I realized, you know? So it was almost like I now, I understood for real what they went through. If, if someone had told me I was going to lose my mom, of course, maybe I'll be like, oh yeah, maybe I'll lose at some point, but not after I, have, have, I just had a baby. So I, it was really painful because um, the usual thing is when you have a baby, the baby has a headache. Hi, mom, what do I do? What? And she'll be like, don't worry, she has whatever, whatever. The, this is what she'll do, add water, pour milk, mix this up. I didn't have that. So I depended on a lot of books. Internet, Google, Google became my really best friend, you know? And um, I just had to figure it out. The thing I don't like about death is the finality of it. Like, I kept craving, I just wanted to see my mom just for one day, one, one minute, just to say goodbye, just to see her, just ask her a few questions, you know? It's just a finality, like, that's it. You're never gonna see this person again. You know, and like I told you, I, I thought I just became, even till now, I think about death every day and my mortality. It wasn't something that used to happen before, but now it is real. And I try to prepare, especially with my daughter. I try to teach her how to be independent and strong. Then, you know, I mean, I, of course I don't tell her, well, mommy, mommy is gonna die tomorrow. I don't tell her that. After my mom died, I was devastated, I was sad, I didn't know what to do with my life, and it was actually at a funeral, um, so we had this Agonye woman come to cook for her at a funeral in Ibado, and her food tasted really nice. And after the funeral, I thought to myself, maybe I should get this woman, because I've been to a few parties with the really nice presentation and the food tastes horrible. So maybe I should take this woman, bring my presentation to it, and maybe I should be a caterer, but not the kind of caterer that gets her hands dirty. The caterer that will actually just bring things together. And now that I think about it, I, I guess that's the beginning of it, because what I actually do is bring things together from nothing into something. 
when I did this catering presentation type thing for a while, and then I wanted more, I, I thought I could do more. I'd go to events, I'll attend events and come away with a feeling of, why did I just waste my three hours here? What, what is this about? Every birthday party looked and felt the same to me. Every corporate event looked and felt the same thing to me. They had the same artists, the same. It was just so boring. And someone said something once that if you're in church and you feel the choir, you could do better than the choir, then maybe God is calling you to go and sing. You know, if if, if you, you find yourself in a space that you, you're constantly irritated with that thing, that means your 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 calling is to fix it and i said you know what i think i can do better than this and that's how i started i believe that if i wasn't in this industry whatever i decided to do i would do well first because i just believe in doing anything that, that i that my hands that i put my hands on well that's just it it's Take me to Balogo to sell clothes. I'll be the best clothes seller there. Because that, that's just the way I'm wired. Um, so now I feel that if there's anything, put me in anything where I can express my creativity, I can put processes in place, I can execute to perfection, those three things, I'll be good. And that's what I'm able to do through events production and design right now. So I decided I wanted to be an event planner. I, or I decided I could change the world one event at a time, like they say. Uh, so I started talking to people. Oh, I can plan your event. And they'll be like, oh yeah, so what events have you done? And I'll say, none. Oh well, uh, you don't have the experience to do, to plan my event. And I'll be like, but I can, but you haven't done anything. So it became, okay, how am I supposed to get better if you don't give me a chance? So that's how it started. And then I did um, some friends, some auntie's wedding. And of course, she was not going to pay me because I have no experience. And she wasn't even sure if she needed an event planner. I said, don't worry, you need an event planner. <laughs> because I just wanted to be able to tell the next person that I did that event, you know. So we did that. I paid for the ushers because she, was, she didn't care, really. And the event went well. And then my first corporate event was an event I did um, for one of those banks. They wanted to have a merger. And I talked to my friend and he said, look, for me, this event is not, it's not a small event. Too. Are you sure you can handle it? I said, I can. He said, but my people have told me that I have to use, my people from South Africa told me, to engage this other event planner, this person is bigger than you are, has more experience. I guess that was the way I looked into his eyes and I, I said, I promise I will not let you down. I will give you everything, you know, I, I can. I put in everything to do this event. And um, I worked as hard as I could. I stayed at the venue all night. When his team from South Africa came, they had a long checklist. I was ready for them. And they sat with me, and after five minutes, they said, you know what, let's go to the club. She, she, she's got this, you know. And that's how I did that event. But even then, with the fact that I didn't have a lot of experience, I didn't have a lot of, um, I hadn't done a lot of events, I knew exactly the kind of events I wanted to do. And I would not take on just any job for the sake of it. Call it pride, call it whatever. I, I didn't even know what it was then. It was just so important for me to be associated with certain kinds of events. So it wasn't about the numbers. It wasn't about whether I did 20 events. It wasn't. I was happy with, having, with doing one event a month or one in a year. I was just happy with it. But the one, anytime I got the opportunity, I would give it everything. And before I knew it, people started saying, you know what, if you want to get your stuff done, go and talk to Evio of No Surprises. And that's it. When you're starting a business, people would rather deal with the guys with the big names. I mean, it's just the same way I'm sure 
the guys upcoming now in the events industry would probably hate me like oh no surprise it's getting all the work but you see i paid my dues and everybody should pay their dues someone asked me once uh, about some up, up, up and coming event planner said um right now I've, I've reached a point where i don't pitch for business not because i think i have too much business but because i've seen the way people disrespect creative people you put in all the hours you put together a powerpoint presentation and they just take your ideas and give it to their friend to execute so i just got tired of that so now it's if you want me to work on your work first of all there is a process and i will control that process yeah because you have come to me because of what you have seen or heard me do so i don't have to work that hard to prove anything to you and that is where we are now but someone asked me now so what do i do you know i pitch and you know sometimes i work they don't pay me what do i do i'm tired of this nonsense and i tell her you will do it you will continue to do it because that is how you grow so if you're up and coming i'm not going to tell you don't pitch i'm not going to tell you that i got here because i went through that so you have to go through because even when going through that you are learning a lot of stuff that will help you. Now I can tell when a client is serious or when when they're serious or not because I have the experience. I know the things you'll say and do. But if I went from zero to here, I wouldn't know that. If I could choose between not paying my dues and being here and paying my dues, I would pay my dues all over again. I've learned so much from paying my dues. A lot of lessons even the clients who owed and refused to pay the member of staff that stabbed you in the back the people you trusted that betrayed you oh my god it's amazing they have shaped me and made me who i am today this issue of being a woman thing i i i think a lot of people have overflogged it in my opinion and maybe some people will turn off their tv or computers or whatever after this but i think it's been overflogged and i think some people have used it to their advantage to make money or whatever trying to paint women as the weaker sex and all and i i know that i know that there is discrimination i'm not going to sit here and say it does not exist it does exist i believe that if a man and a woman do the same things they should be paid equally right um but i don't see myself as being special being a woman i just do what i need to do because we have to be careful in in this in in saying that women are being marginalized we we have to be careful that we're not drawing unnecessary attention to ourselves and making ourselves look like i don't want to be pitied i don't want to be looked you know i'm i just do what i need to do um have there been times when I went into a pitch with a competitor that's male yeah and have, have there been times when I lost yeah did I think about it that it's, it's because I'm a woman no that's not the first thing I think about when I lose a pitch or I lose business to a male competitor I'm thinking what did I do wrong what can I do better I promise you I'm not thinking that oh it's because I'm a woman no oh my I don't I don't I don't do that you know and I feel that if you're so good at what you do only a stupid client will not give you the job because you're a woman and if they do then they're not worthy of my work of my service they're not I don't even want to deal with you you know so that's my take on it I try very hard not to spoil my child. I I hope I'm not doing any damage. You know, I am I try to do the opposite. I love her. I try to show her that I love her. But spoiling is one thing I don't think I'm going. I'm sure I maybe I have done a few things because she's the only child for now like I said. But I try my best not to be seen as spoiling her. So now we're sending her off to boarding school. It's a very tough decision for me. 
because I'm busy most of the time anyway. There was this particular day, um, this last Christmas, I had like three events I was juggling. And her nanny went off. She said she was ill. She went off somewhere. And I was stuck with my daughter. I had to take her to school. And I had three events to plan. And I had the clients calling me. And she was, she came to my room like four times. She can be very impatient. She took that after, she took after me. Mommy, I have to go to school. Mommy, this is someone who usually go to school at about six o'clock because of traffic. There I was at 8.30 answering all these calls, on sending emails. And she said, mommy, I have to go to school. Mommy, I have... she came in like three times. And at some point I yelled at her, Zina, leave me alone. I have to, so I had to come. I said, okay, Zina, you know what? Let me explain. Mommy is in a lot of trouble right now because some clients are not very happy. And I explained everything to her. And she said, oh, okay, mommy, I understand. Don't worry, I'll be in my room. When you're ready, come get me. And you know, that was so sweet. So she understands. And um, I took some time off, like a week or so, and I stayed. I said, Zina, I'm going to be at home with you today. And she was so happy. And, you know, sometimes she'd be like, do you have any events? You know, and I'm like, no, not now. And sometimes I take her for setup, just so she sees and she appreciates what I do. So it's really fun. But right now, she's, I try to involve her as much as possible and explain to her and talk to her like an adult. You know, and she really, she understands. So it's not just leave mommy alone, go and sit down. No, I explain everything to her. I'm also very careful not to make her whole world revolve around me because for some reason, since my mom died, it's, I, I tell my husband I've become so morbid. I think, I think about death too often and my mortality. I think about that a lot. I ask myself, what if something happens to me now? I don't pray to die now. I want to live to be 90 or whatever. But what is she going to do? You know, um, I'm blessed. I'm lucky that my mom died after I got married and I had a baby. I wish she had stayed for longer, but she left me when she left me. But I ask myself, if she left me when I was 10 or 5, what would I have done? You know, it's a question. It's scary for me. So I try to bring up my child in a way to make her independent. If something happens to me today, how is she going to cope? When I took my daughter to school for the interview, to the school she'll maybe go into in September, the person interviewing my daughter asked a question. He said, what's important for you, for this child? And I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, she said, oh, I use academics or whatever. I said, now that I think about it, I'm not... She doesn't have to be a straight A student. I'm more important that she's well grounded. I'm more important that she's a human being that has compassion. I'm more, I'm more, I mean, sorry, I mean, I'm more particular, I mean, about her being a well grounded child, being a human being who has compassion for other people. Um, I'd like her to be someone who would go for whatever she feels in her heart, her passion, to be the best that she can be, to stand out in her own way, to be, to be respected and to do things in her own terms, you know. Um, that is more important to me than straight A's, really. Making a mark, making a dent in whatever you, you choose to do, she chooses to do. The going off to boarding school is also to allow her mix with other children so she knows that, look, sometimes you want to watch TV, you have three other kids who want to watch another channel. Because right now, she, she's the queen, you know. She has her TV, she does whatever she wants to do at, at any time. I get into work, I'm very addicted to my job. It's, it's so bad that one day someone asked me, what do you do to relax? And Kemi, I, I had to think about it. Like, and that was the moment I thought, what am I doing? Like, what do I do for relaxation? I don't relax. Everything is about work, 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 work. Even when I'm tired, when you start talking about work, I'm up. So I have to work hard at balancing it and be there for my, hus for my husband and my daughter. I don't know of anybody who has been able to find a solution to this whole balancing thing. I definitely haven't. <laughs> It's something I struggle with every day. And yes, sometimes some things will suffer. You know, like the day that um, 
I had to take my daughter to school late because, you know, I had a crisis at work. Um, but when I can, I make sure it's 100% so they know that if I could, I would. I used to think that you needed one mentor, someone who was older, richer, wiser, accomplished so much. It's just that figure there who you'd go and talk to and say, yeah, don't worry, my child, I have the answers, right? Wrong. I have found that my, I don't have one mentor. I don't even think my mentors know that they are my mentors. I draw inspiration from people. I, you inspire me, by the way, you know? I draw inspiration from young people, old people, male, female, and it's, it's almost like, I don't know if this is for you, you know, growing up, you had those friends that when you wanted to go to a party, you knew, you knew who to call. When you wanted to go to church, maybe you had a problem, you wanted someone to pray with you, you knew who to call. When you wanted, so that's, that's the way it is for me. When I want to talk business, I have people I call, and I know they will tell me the truth. When I, wanted, when I want, want to meet people, I know who to, so that's the way it's been. You know, so I, I don't have one mentor. I, I get inspiration and experience. I just draw, it might be even reading a book and I get something from that book and I, I use it. I think I'm a mentor to my team actually because for me, it's beyond them just coming to work. I tell them this is like a passage. You're passing through this place in your journey of, of life. And I want to be part of your success story. I want you to be able to say, there are people we have all met and we're like, that person, I wish I'd never met this person. And there are people like, oh my God, this person taught me this thing and I've used it. So I tell them, you're here, you're working with me, but while you're here, get as much as you can. I wish I had somebody who could give me all the advice I'm giving you now. So it's very important that you have a mentor. Um, but what I try to, a few people have approached me to say, I want you to be my mentor. But I tell them that, are you ready to hear the truth? One. Two, I think I get all academic. Some of them just, you know, to say this man doesn't know what she's talking about. I tell them, go and make a list. What is it you want from me? What is it you want to change about your life? What are your objectives? And we'll agree together. And we'll agree a time frame. So if it's three months, if it's six months, we start on this journey together. So if it's, if you want me to teach you about businesses, you tell me where you are now and where do you want to be? And I'll put you on a, like a mini program. It's not anything academic, but if I'm going to be your mentor, then let me see the benefits of me being your mentor three months later, because I'm not your friend. You know, we are not pals. We are not, we're not going to go out and be, we can hang out because, hey, we're cool. But if you want me to be a mentor, then you have to be ready to listen to me and you know, take my experiences and use them. I don't believe I have competition. I know I do, but I feel we're all in different lanes and there's room for everybody to grow, to do your own thing. And I just feel that what God has given me is different from what God has given somebody else. So. I just want to be the best of what I have been given, of who I am. I don't want my work to ever be questioned, ever. Like, who did that for me? It's terrible, that will kill me. That will just kill me. Sometimes I leave work and I say to myself, I'm not coming back to this office for two weeks, I'm done. I need a break and before I know it I'm on my way to work the next day I'm like I thought I said I wasn't going to work tomorrow so it happens I hate being in the comfort zone you know I'm like okay so what's next what's next no no I don't want to be a local champion <laughs> I need to, the next big project that that project that's gonna make me scared you know and feel am I gonna be able to do it yeah now we're talking I am very tough, but if you get to understand me, I'm all about the work. 
and results oriented. Once you get the results, you can get away with murder. I don't care. Do whatever you want to do. But the re- we have to get the results. I don't like long stories. I hate people who come up with excuses because we can all give excuses. I could have given you a million excuses why I'm, I, I couldn't make this interview today, but I made it because it was important to me. So it's about what's important to you.